my shoes and out the door. Five, I'm alive, six, seven, eight, feeling great. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. I'm your co-host today, Dr. Mike Akinfora. And today I have with me Jess Higgins Kelly and Dr. Nasha Winters. Ladies, how are we doing today? Excellent. Thanks for having us. Wonderful. Yeah, fantastic. I, you ladies have written a phenomenal book that I really want to share with our tribe. It is near and dear to my heart because it's something both my wife, my partners, and I all adhere to uh, a ketogenic diet. But the book that you've written, I really haven't seen much in the field as it relates. And let me let me share this. It's not a secret, guys. It's just me <laughs> leading up to it. The Metabolic Approach to Cancer, Integrating Deep Nutrition, the Ketogenic Diet, and Non-Toxic Bio-Individualized Therapies. So this book is really one of the first of its kind when we're, we're talking about this. But before we dive into the book, what I would really like and what our, our tribe would really like is your backstory. So tell us how you got here. Uh, you can pick who wants to go first. It's completely up to you. Oh, uh, let me read the bios of these fine authors, and then we'll get right into this. Dr. Nasha Winters, N-D-F-A-B-N-O-L-A-C, and Diplomat of Oriental Medicine is the founder, CEO, and visionary of Optimal Terrain Consulting. She's been working in the healthcare industry for 25 years and is a nationally board-certified naturopathic doctor, licensed acupuncturist, uh, practitioner of Oriental Medicine, and is a fellow of the American Board of Naturopathic Oncology. Initially motivated by a terminal cancer diagnosis 25 years ago, she now lectures all over the world and trains physicians in the application of mistletoe therapy, consults with researchers on projects involving immune modulation via mistletoe, hyperthermia, and the ketogenic diet. She lives in Durango, Colorado. Jess Higgins Kelly, MNT, is the CEO of Remission Nutrition, a global oncology nutrition therapy consulting and education enterprise. She's also the founder of Oncology Nutrition Therapy Program at the Nutrition Therapy Institute. With an undergraduate degree in journalism, Jess has written health and nutrition articles for local and national publications and is the former managing editor of Edible Southwest Colorado Magazine. She lives in Mid-Coast, Maine. Ladies, welcome to the program. Thanks for having having us. That was a mouthful. (laughs) And 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 that was the the Cliff Notes version. (laughs) And the funny thing is people are going to wonder why I'm laughing because most of my uh, fumbling of bios, it's a big joke for my partners because I cut – I have the team cut most of what I'm saying, Um, but it is wonderful to have you ladies on the show. I'm thrilled to talk about this book. I've been looking forward to this interview. As, As I said, it is near and dear to my heart. Before we do that, I need to know what your journeys are. Well, I guess I'll go first um, uh, because Jeff and I kind of came in midway with each other's lives. So um, this is Dr. Nisha, and I was well on my way to becoming a conventional uh, conventional doctor. I was always passionate about medicine and health and healing, but my own healthcare um, hiccup, if you will, took me on an entirely new path. Um, at age 19, after a year of some terrible, terrible symptoms that just kept getting missed and misdiagnosed, as well as pretty much an entire life of really poor health, I kind of popped out into this world with bad health, um, I was diagnosed with a terminal illness, and not much hope was offered. And, you know, before we started this show today, um, uh, Dr. Mike, you also mentioned that you're a huge fan of Bruce Lipton's work and, um, you know, his work on epigenetics. And Thankfully, my uh, frustration with the Western medical model is what threw me into the library, and I picked up the book Quantum Healing in 1991, very newly released by, at that time, very unknown Dr. Deepak Chopra, and that book completely changed the trajectory of my life and my studies from conventional medicine to looking for and finding naturopathic medicine, and of course, my own sort of crawling back out of a statistic and of a bad, um, you know, a a bad 
a prognosis into what has now become, you know, 25 and a half years later, still with you all, um, and helping tens of thousands of patients on this journey of cancer as well in a more integrative oncology, terrain-centric, not tumor-centric approach to bringing people back to optimal health. Brilliant. Uh, Jess, what's your backstory? (laughs) Yeah, so backstory for me is I uh, went to nutrition school almost 10 years ago, graduated, started just doing general family practice, nutrition therapies, you know, anything from weight loss to, you know, at that time, 10 years ago, gluten-free was just starting to (laughs) to get some traction. It was kind of new. So I did a lot of that with folks and boy, we've come so far from that. And then um, about five or six years ago, um, connected with Nisha because we were both in Durango and um, she said, please come to the clinic. (laughs) And uh, and I said, all right. And that really started making me uh, get closer to um, working with oncology um, um, patients. And so my practice sort of shifted to doing oncology only and um and then was lucky enough to do a lot of retreats group retreats with yeah. Nisha and her husband Steve and uh you know we did those and they've done those um all over the world mm-hmm. and uh that really got a lot of the momentum going for the book um yeah. and then of course we've learned so much about ketogenic diet I mean gosh gone from recommending just gluten-free bread to, you know, the ketogenic <laughs> diet. I tell people the world of nutrition has changed, you know, continues to change so much. And and then here we are, you know, really knowing the benefit of the ketogenic diet. And then um, my dad got diagnosed with a glioblastoma multiform in December of 2015. And so it was really uh, serendipitous that I happened to practice oncology nutrition and was a uh, really stepped up my passion for um, helping people um, to see that process with him. And he really dove into the ketogenic diet and had awesome quality of life for longer than most people um, do with GBMs. And so that was uh, quite the journey. And that happened sort of alongside with writing the book. So mm-hmm. um, really been involved in the cancer world. And I developed a, and founded a program, at the Nutrition Therapy Institute, to help uh, other nutritionists become certified in oncology nutrition so that we actually get um, people out there who know what they're talking about. So, um, <laughs> yeah, that's my story. <laughs> Beautiful. Absolutely. You know, and it's really interesting that those of us in, in the healthcare space, um, it usually is something that occurs to uh, in us or one or, yeah. or people that are close to us. And, and I yeah. think that's, that's the calling card of I'm not going to accept this model that's presented in front of me. I want to figure it out. And and Marie Forleo says everything's figure outable. Everything. That's <laughs> awesome. Are you talking Marie Forleo from the Chopra Center? Uh, Marie Forleo is uh, a business coach. Um, okay. She does a whole bunch of things. She she founded. Um, B like boy school, oh, but it is okay. a it is yeah. um, really geared towards women. I, my wife has taken Beautiful. the class. It's it's phenomenal. She offers it once a year. It is all encompassing. A really great great program. So um, wow. True, and she's she's from New Jersey. So you know everybody from everybody passes through New Jersey. By the <laughs> way, the whole world comes and- through New Jersey at some point. I love it because she is actually the daughter of one of our mentors and local celebrities in Durango and healers, Dr. Jim Forleo. And That's he's fun. written a great book on health is simple and is mm-hmm. a good friend and mentor um, in my life. So it's really beautiful that you bring that up. That's what just kind of gave me a little ripple because, um, yeah, just the, the connection of this, the circle you just ah. brought forth here is quite powerful because she is connected with Dr. Chopra and given that he is such a powerful um, influencer in my life, I just think that was very ironic that that came out of your mouth. Uh, that, <laughs> is, that is a little <laughs> <Pretty> serendipity. <cool. laughs> <laughs> Gorgeous. Yay. 
All yeah. right. I, and I, that actually reminds me of the talk. You just did an amazing interview on that moment of like capturing those moments of serendipity and joy with your most, your most previous interview. I was really blown away and touched by that. So again, the serendipity of this is quite beautiful. Oh, that's amazing. That was with uh, Dr. Mm. Laura Foster who's a really good friend yeah. of mine up in, up in Canada oh, and good. just yeah. a really, really, um, and you can tell just by, it really mm. comes through. It's amazing this medium that we have mm. and the opportunity that we have. So years ago, if you had written a book 20 years ago, you guys would be off on a book tour for months. Right. For months. <laughs> and now this little thing called a podcast allows us <laughs> to get in front. Like you've, you've taken the time, and this is what I really appreciate about interviewing authors. Like you're so passionate mm about your baby this is your baby you, gave, you, you both gave birth to this and yeah. you, that's you, funny too and we you use can, that analogy a lot yeah and you can you can now get in front of like five hundred thousand people in in one show yeah. and, and that's amazing and to me it it, it honors you in what you do and the fact that you want to share it just goes above and beyond what we could have done 20 years ago 10 years ago so i want to dive into the book um in in the the big takeaway the 37,000 foot view of this is the terrain 10 could one of you talk to the audience first about what the Terrain 10 is, and then Absolutely. we'll take it from there. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. So um, I know we'll go into kind of that bird's eye view. I like your perspective there. Um, um, and then Jess will go into some of the deeper details, sure. and then I'll pick up a few as well. Um, I'm very visual. So I, you know, the the way I see this process and the way that Jess sees it, that's why we connect so much is we see things very similarly. We see things in patterns and we see things in relationship to our internal and external um, nature and environment and exposures of that. So when I think about the terrain 10, I think about a tree analogy and I think about the soil of which that tree is growing out of as the microbiome. Mm -hmm. I think of the canopy of that big, bushy, healthy tree as the epigenetics of what we, you know, got from our, our ancestry. Mm -hmm. I think about the trunk that connects those two, the canopy and the soil, as the mental emotional um, component. And then those branches um, coming off of that trunk, things like um, sugar, you know, or like sugar metabolism, so fuel sources for our body, um, toxicants and known carcinogens, um, the immune function, inflammatory processes, uh, circulatory aspects such as even angiogenesis, very specific to cancer, which is the growth of new vessels to a tumor site, and even things like the patterns, our rhythms, our seasons internally and externally in that circadian rhythm and stress response. And then finally, the biggest one to tackle is often the mental, emotional, you know, well-being of that trunk. Um, and I repeat that because it, it's one that we obviously leave for the end of the book um, because it's often the one that folks kind of put off um, <laughs> until they have to dig in. Um, but those are that's kind of the visual that, I, that we see the terrain 10 from that bird's eye view. Um, and then you can start to dig deeper. So let's, yeah, yeah that, thanks, Nisha. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Yeah. Let's dig yeah. deeper on this and let's start with uh, the the genetic part of what we're talking about, the epigenetics and the nutrigenomic modifications. Yeah, I can answer that. This is Jess. So basically what, what this Terrain 10 is, is we've identified throughout you know, over 35 years of collective practice that uh, there's, there's 10 different areas of your terrain that can impact and influence a, a cancer process. So that's what this terrain ten, these terrain ten are. And currently, you know, Western medicine has a view that, well, cancer is just bad genes or bad luck. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, what we describe in uh, genetics and epigenetics is our first chapter in the book, and we really outline and and reference uh, quite a bit about how studies have shown that only five to ten percent of cancer cases is rooted in in damaged DNA, you know, 
DNA damage, it's genetics, that's, that's the deal, you know, BRCA, that type of thing. Whereas the rest, we're really looking at our genes work more like light switches, right? So they turn on and off. That's epigenetics. They respond to our environment. And so what we talk about, you know, things that we're seeing, uh, you know, genetic things that we identify, lactose intolerance, you know, and, and other food-related things, you know, celiac disease, some of these things that are rooted um, in our genes, in our DNA, that, uh, that because of our modern diets can cause inflammation and, you know, tie into some of the other uh, terrain areas because they are all uh, so connected. So uh, really, it's, it's important for people to know uh, and have a little bit more personal responsibility around cancer is not bad luck, um, and it's not always our, you know, DNA is not our destiny. I think that might be our opening <laughs> line of the chapter. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it really does depend on how our bodies are responding to what we're putting into it and what's around it. So, you know, we've seen that people, you know, who have – ancestors or even grandparents, you know, there was a study that came out that said, or a paper, you are what your grandparents ate. So it's, <laughs> it's not, you know, we're, we have, our bodies are responding to traumas and uh, famines and all these other things. And then that's trickling down to us. And so, but the good news is, is that uh, people have the ability to, you know, to, to manage their genes, to help to support healthy genes and uh, and healthy DNA by enhancing their diets by, you know, eating folate-rich foods, you know? I mean, it's so hard to find people. It's like, I should make a bumper sticker that's like, have you had your dark leafy greens today? You know? <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> <just> don't. <laughs> so it's things like that. You know, the study that came out that found that, um, you know, BRCA carriers that consumed 40 milligrams, I think, of selenium, uh, were able to normalize their DNA damage that occurred from being a BRCA carrier to be the same as non-BRCA carriers. So, I mean, with folate and selenium and some of these nutritional tools, we have the ability uh, to address genetic issues. And I think that's really empowering for people to know that we have the ability to impact this, you know, our, our DNA on a nutritional level. So, yeah. Jess, I love that analogy that you used. It's like a light switch. I don't want that to get lost mm -hmm. on people. That means, mm -hmm. folks, that you can turn that light switch on and off at any time, at any mm -hmm. age. This is really, yeah. really important. If you have XYZ condition, you can actually turn those genes off. And most times... It's with nutrition. And, and yep. this is brilliant. And uh, the other thing that I, I've seen in the book is you've, you've both taken the time to uh, assess your terrain. And I think mm -hmm. that's super important because most books don't do it justice. So really just dial into that a little bit for me. Yeah, so one of the things that Jess and I thought would be helpful in trying to articulate a lot of information that we have, like she said, collected over 35, 40 years was we got to have a starting point for people. Where do you begin? Where do you start looking, right? And so we basically, in each of those Terrain 10, we created 10 questions for each of the Terrain 10 that are things that most people wouldn't think about. Okay, so I'll back up just a moment. Jess and I have had multiple people say to us, <laughs> probably every person say to us, wow, it was really healthy until I was diagnosed with cancer. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm here to tell you, after looking at tens of thousands of labs and taking tens of thousands of really good histories, that wasn't the case. We just didn't know that we were not healthy, that we were so far out of balance. You know, that analogy of like the frog that gets put into a cold pot of water on the stove and you turn it up and slowly it boils to death because it doesn't notice, you know, that the water is slowly war warming up around it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a horrific concept, but that's what we're doing to ourselves. Like we become a little numb, a little disconnected, a little disassociated, or we just become really used to our circumstances. And so we wanted to ask questions that go above and beyond what people would typically think would be the cause and effect of a cancer or chronic illness process. So it really surprises people when they start to do the questionnaire. So we have folks do the questionnaire and get a sense of maybe out of those 10 
sections, which one stands out the most or which two or three stand out the most. And then that's a starting point. That's a priority. And so, you know, you can read the book cover to cover, but you could also start at the area that stands out the most for you to need to be paying attention to. And so that's where we got the concept and kind of introduced the book and really started talking about the real, you know, prevention starts with assessment, self-awareness, mm-hmm. mindfulness, and deep understanding of what's happening under the hood. And this is the part that I think is really important is, and I assume this is why you wrote the book, is you do this, like like myself, uh, being in active practice, you do this with patients or clients every day. We partner with them. We're, you know, we're not fixing people. We're partnering with them on this journey. And now you've written a book that actually gets down to this. These 10 questions really help to dial in for people. The, like you said, the two or three most important or, or highest ranking for them. And that's brilliant. That's brilliant. It's Thank not you. just a jacuzzi experience. You, you're giving people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no pun intended. Um, but you really <laughs> help them to fully understand and embrace their own life rather than, you know, going to the doctor. And, and you're working in oncology, ladies. This is a big deal. Yeah. This is, you know, yeah. this is it. It's it's mm-hmm. it's a big deal. So Mm -hmm. um, what what's the next one that we're going to talk about? I think Jeff is going to go into the whole concept of the metabolic approach and how sugar plays a role in that. Yeah. Perfect. Because that doesn't affect that doesn't affect anybody. Right. Yeah, not at all. No one has. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Uh, All right, Jess, take it away. Yeah, thanks. This, This is our second chapter. You know, after we kind of get the uh, the umbrella here of the uh, the genetic epigenetic aspect, it's blood sugar, and I think it is amazing how we just you know we can't go forward unless we understand our past, and we have become so inundated with sugar that it's become the new normal. People just think that it's normal to have. You know, our, our classic example that we use with, you know, people, I thought it was healthy, you know, yogurt and granola for breakfast. Like, wow, I eat really healthy, you know. I, I thought that was a healthy breakfast. And, we, you know, we've given lectures before where it's like, well, you know, that's probably close to 50 grams of sugar in a lot of cases, depending on the products you're using, which is, you know, three times what people, you know, should be having. And so it just adds up so quickly and the impact like just the poisonous elements of sugar from depleting nutrients to fueling cancer so research has found and pet scans confirm this that uh, cancer cells increase their rate of glycolysis in order to fuel their frenzied uh, growth and so they consume sugar at a faster rate than normal cells do. So, you know, we all have microscopic amounts of, of cancer cells floating around our body. It's just, you know, it's these terrain terms, like blood sugar, that just says, give them that little push. You know, we use a, a mosh pit analogy, an analogy in the book. It's just like, hey, I was kind of doing okay, but boom, this just pushed me up and over into the mosh pit. And now I am, I'm a mm-hmm. cancer cell and I'm, I'm fueled out of control. And so it's, you know, every morning you wake up, you think, hey, I'm having my yogurt, my granola, my coffee with a little, you know, creamer in it. And bam, our sugar is so yeah. out of control. And people have no idea because they read labels. They look at calories and they look at fat. This is unfortunately how our <laughs> Western model of nutrition has um, ingrained this in people. And it's so utterly horrifically wrong uh, that, uh, you know, we've, we've been taught to look that way. And we say, look at the sugar and look at the ingredients. Because your body will tell you um, when you're full um, if you're eating the right foods. But uh, instead, we're just too concerned about fat. We're too concerned about calories. And it's completely uh, gotten us on a very wrong and very dangerous track. And so we talk about the book, of course, about the ketogenic diet. Um, and that tool to use, um, by no means is it a cure for cancer, you know, mm. I put that out there, but it's a tool to have in the toolbox, right? Because what the studies that are coming out that we're seeing, I mean, almost on a daily basis, that when you're using the ketogenic diet, a high fat, low carbohydrate, zero sugar diet, 
um, cancer cells, um, it destabilizes them, right? So it's yeah. making conventional treatments like chemotherapy, like radiation, a lot more effective. Mm. So why not have this tool on board? I mean, really, mm-hmm. the case for this book is to bring nutrition therapy and this approach should be part of a standard of care. There's absolutely no reason why it shouldn't because it's very effective. And so blood sugar is just such a big, it's a big component for people. And sadly, I mean, I saw it when I was sitting in the hospital, it was six o'clock in the morning and my dad just got wheeled away for his second brain surgery. And a lady comes through and offers us cookies. (laughs) I I know that our hearts are in the right place and food is comfort, but I'm like, you know, we don't need cookies at six o'clock in right. the morning. You don't need to be sitting on an airplane being passed. Oh, here's a cookie. They just hand it to you. And people, it's like no one's thinking. They're just on autopilot. It's like, oh, here's a cookie. Shall I take the cookie? I'll eat the cookie. I'm sitting on an airplane. It's eight o'clock in the morning. Mm-hmm. It's like, what is going on? <laughs> We're just not even thinking about the sugar element. And so we really wanted to bring that to light in the book um, and give people some tools to reduce <laughs> and replace. So, yeah. Absolutely. You know, my, my wife, is a classically trained pastry chef. My tribe, our, my mm. tribe knows all about wow. this. So, you know, and as as a dutiful husband, I would when she was in school, I would eat everything that she made because I'm a good guy. I want to make sure yeah. that she was really good at what she did. And I'd always been an athlete, and I've always worked out since the time I was 13, 40 yeah. some odd years ago. But the funny thing was that I stopped working out, but I kept eating because she had she knew how to bakery. So yeah. you know, I'd want to spend time with her in the morning, so I'd go to the bakery and I'd have to eat a couple scones just because they look good and they smell good. Oh, yeah. And that you wind up at the end of the day, the autopilot, which you just talked about, is I looked in yeah. the mirror, I was like, I don't even know who this guy is. Because that's not me. And then kids wow. come along and you wind up with this this perfect storm and mm. it 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 takes you out of autopilot. Mm. And then for us mm-hmm. that the, the, the defining moment was on my way to work, she calls me up and says, Oh, the OBGYN wants me to come in and talk to her. I said, Oh, I'm coming home. And she's like, wow. oh, no, I'll go. I was like, oh, no, sweetie, she she doesn't want to have donuts with you. There's yeah. When they call you with that, the there's yeah. something yeah. wrong. She goes, I'll yeah. be fine. Mm-hmm. I said, you will be fine, but I'll be next to you being fine. Aww. And wow. for her, ju- and, 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 you know, nine years, eight years later, for her, mm-hmm. she says what Lance Armstrong said. Cancer is the best thing ever happened to me. Yeah. Oof. Because yeah. it it woke her up. It made her take yeah. control of her life. And this is the yeah. book that you've written. You have it in mm. here, all of it. And yeah. my my come to Jesus moment was, okay, <laughs> I, I was getting healthier. I was getting healthier. But then the thought was, oh, my God, I may actually be, I may actually have to raise two children by myself. So um. I better take really good care of myself and in the research i did i i I found in 2009 pet scans okay this is a radioactive glucose molecule Mm -hmm. that looks for its friends because when there's a community there that's not good that it's attracted to these other clumps of glucose and that's Mm -hmm. where cancer lives so my thought at that time in 2009 was we can't have any more sugar we just have mm. to ha- stop oh. eating sugar altogether. And I would love to say, oh, it was easy. Uh, it was a hell of a lot <laughs> easier knowing that it was truly life or death. Like, that's how I looked at it. Right. And guys right. have a tendency. We can do that. It's easier for us to turn mm-hmm. on and off. Mm-hmm. But yeah. that was my come to come to Jesus moment and never looked back. Wow. Wow. And I think it's so interesting that you ran across that information as far back as 2009. And yet at that time, Dr. Thomas Seacard's book had not come out yet, which came out, I think, in 2011 on cancer as a metabolic disease, which was resurrecting the whole Otter Warburg concepts from the 1920s, showing this sort of 
metabolic dysfunction of cancer cells um, you know, or of, of mitochondria that would lead to cancering processes, I should say. And so as a naturopathic doctor working with cancer patients and myself since 1991 and on and on and on, I was saying this to people for, you know, since the early 90s, mm-hmm. and everyone told me I was, well, frankly, batshit crazy. But like, yep. I was the quack. I was the weirdo saying these concepts. I am still shocked today here in 2017 that there are actually still doctors out there telling patients that sugar and diet have no role in the treatment prevention or support of a patient with cancer. And mm-hmm. I just, I'm horrified. I, I, I literally, I, if any of those doctors are listening right now, um, please, please get yourself up to speed because that's, that's negligent. And we've come too far to pretend. I mean, we've known this since the 1920s, actually even before that, but we have really brought the data to light, um, including studies even out of MD Anderson and other um, others mm-hmm. that are showing the impact of sugar on a variety of cancer and cancer progression and proliferation of the of the cells. So, you know, I'm glad that Jess really dove into a little bit of, of sugar being the issue, but there's still, unfortunately, a lot of folks that don't want to hear this for whatever reason. For for whatever reason, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> we'll leave it at that. You know what? It, I mean, part of it, honestly, is it's it's no different than cocaine in our brain. You know, it right. is extremely addictive. So a lot of my um, colleagues out there that are still saying, oh, maybe it's not that big of a deal, I would encourage them to explore their own sugar addiction, you know, because I mm. think that that could be tainting the picture a little bit. So we'll, we'll move on from there. But it is. It's a big one. So I, I love that we got to dive into that a bit. And your story, um, Dr. Mike, is so compelling. You know, like you said in the early on of our interview, most of us come to this point because of a very personal, intimate experience. Mm-hmm. It, is, it is very, very, very true. And we could, if we chose, keep it to ourselves. But uh-huh. we only go yeah. through this thing called life once. Yeah. And I think it is our moral responsibility to share our stories with people and people it mm-hmm. resonates because they know mm-hmm. they know it's authentic. They know it's transparent mm-hmm. and you, you mm-hmm. really that you've taken it to the next level in writing a book about it because you could have been perfectly happy and helped people <laughs> in your separate practices. But you actually took the time <laughs> out to actually do this really, really great work, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It, you. You speak to it so much because it was definitely a collective labor of love and yep. a need to not say the same thing over and over again or take a year to get all this information into somebody's mm-hmm. head mm-hmm. or a week, a four day intensive to get at least some of this information into somebody's head. It's nice to have basically a textbook for both yes. clinician mm-hmm. and, and patients out there now so that they come in and we're finding that already just with the book being out since the end of May, early June, we're already finding savvy consumers, if you will, who read it and said, I get it. Now I'm ready to go to the Mm -hmm. next step. And that's super exciting for us. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. I love it. I am really cognizant of your time. I I just have a couple more questions Mm -hmm. that I'd, I'd like to go through if that's okay. Mm-hmm, of course. I, I think in in our world today, there our access to information kind of puts us. It, it's a double edged sword, and on one hand, it's never been a better time to access information, but on the other mm-hmm. hand, it gets to be extremely overwhelming. There's so much misinformation and disinformation out there that we get pulled both um, stress wise and emotion wise can can you mm-hmm. talk how you've written about that in the book oh that just gives me chills um you know yeah. one of the other main reasons why Jess and I put this book out there is to basically be mythbusters you know and yeah. and help people navigate the enormous amount of information that is available to our to us at the end of our fingertips today and so you know as you alluded to even the eno- enormous amount of information as well meaning as it may be can cause stress. And stress Mm -hmm. is one of the most significant drivers of metastatic disease. It is one of the main mechanisms 
that drives cellular proliferation and in tissue invasion and metastasis. We don't typically die of a primary tumor, right? That's extremely rare. Um, it's more, that's more about like real estate, like location, 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 maybe something to get pushed off or squeezed off with a tumor. But ultimately, if we're going to have cancer and die from it, it's from a metastatic process. And so ironically, when you're diagnosed with cancer, in my experience, the most stressful moment is the actual diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And the way people respond Whatever built-in mechanisms they have to respond to stress, because it's around us all the time, even good stress looks the same to your physiology. So like a new wedding, you know, a new, a new partnership, a new house, a new baby, those are all good stressors, but you're still having the same physiologic response. Um, and so if we start to educate people about that, it, you know, it's easier said than done. Hey, don't stress over that. But we can actually help with a lot of different tools food being one of them, to help mitigate and calm down an overactive stress response. Um, and so that is key. And part of that is getting back into rhythm with yourself, mm. with your environment in and around you, with your season, with the, even the local, regional, bioavailable foods that are around you help reset set you, you know, looking at your light exposure, are you looking at screens after 5 p.m. at night? If so, put on your orange goggles and turn on the eflux on your computer screen, you know, and try and get off of it much sooner. Things like that are affecting our master um, antioxidant melatonin just from our crazy light exposure. So in the chapter on stress and circadian rhythm, we talk about how to attain that tranquility within and reconnect with our natural cycle within and around us. And that is one of the places that is probably one of the biggest changes we've made in the last hundred years, second only to, to sugar intake. Mm -hmm. And so we are so in an unnatural season and rhythm today that we don't even know it. You know, so you've seen the studies, I'm sure that you could go camping off the grid for two weeks and completely reset your internal mechanisms. And I encourage people to get nature, you know, to take a nice daily dose of nature. I love that little meme that's out there, that little video on nature as a drug. You know, <laughs> side effects include better well-being. You know, <laughs> and so we always encourage our, our clients to get outside, get their hands in the earth, see what the seasons are. Do they know if it's even a full moon or a new moon? You know, watch the sunrise, watch it sunset, turn off your lights, you turn off your screens, you know, hang out. Um, so those are big. And then, of course, a lot of times, a lot of the things we reach for to self-medicate like sugar or like other addictive substances or ways to soothe that stress response are what we're using to band-aid over the mental emotional aspect. And that is a lot of our self soothing mechanisms. And they're, again, they're meant to help us, but they often overflow and cause us harm. And I tell you, we leave the darn, you know, chapter on mental emotional at the end, because it's often the scary. So if I dove into that first with clients, they would probably go running for the hills, but eventually everyone gets there. <laughs> Right. I mean, so everyone true. gets there. And, <laughs> and so I, I wish we would all start there. And some, you know, some folks, some brave folks have read this book and said, wow, the one I tested highest in was this chapter. I guess I'm going in. Mm. And that is like, gives me chills. It's like, okay, our, our, our work here is done. Um, but that's the place that I've literally watched. Um, and it brings some emotion for me, but I have watched people choose death over changing and healing those emotional wounds. Mm. So for instance, I've, I've watched people do everything right. They're doing everything right. Their diet, their lifestyle, their supplements, their meditation, and they're going through the motions on all of that. They're addressing all other of the nine terrain factors perfectly. And yet cancer is still exploding, progressing, taking off. And I've seen it, you know, there could be other issues, obviously, but what I've seen in tens of thousands of patients is it's often the last frontier, the mental, emotional frontier. Mm -hmm. And I've actually had patients choose to avoid dealing with the trauma or the, the um, you know, unfaithful partner or the, you know, the extreme, you know, uh, traumatic experience versus, you know, they'd rather die. And so sometimes those contracts are bigger than what, you know, we as providers can help them with. Um, but I've watched that, you know, m multiple times in the years I've been in practice. So I do tell folks when I'm working with them that eventually um, we'll get to that 
to that last frontier and we'll, we'll need to tackle it. It's an important one. I don't really see people come fully into their healing and their wholeness without going there. I agree with you a thousand percent on that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I just I had a couple of things I just wanted to hit on. When yeah. you, when you talk about nature, it, it's pretty remarkable. My mm-hmm. wife and I grew up in a town that's a city right outside of Manhattan, and it's oh. three square miles, and it's sixty five thousand people in three square miles. Oh my! It's a oh my lot God. of people. <laughs> There's a lot, a lot of people, oh. and. We got to this past week, we visited our our partner. We all got together, both Dr. DeCoya and myself and our accountability partners that meet every Tuesday. And we visited uh, our other partner, Wanda Lee, up in Nova Scotia. And my Mm. wife and I were hysterical because we were saying, there's a lot of nature up here. We're not used to all the nature. And the funny thing is that we now live at the beach. So there is this magic that happens for me every night when I come home, I come over a little bridge and when I come over that bridge, it's like a reset. Like you could actually feel it when you, when you come into the community, which is interestingly enough, it's three square miles with 6,000 people. So it's a little seaside community. (laughs) But when you think about nature and what it does for us, um, and and, Mm -hmm. and they've just recently found the work on on earthing, but that's why everybody's Mm -hmm. so stinking happy when they're at the beach. (laughs) Like we're, it doesn't get any more primordial than walking Mm -hmm. on the beach with the water hitting your feet. It's, it's it's miraculous it's magic it is mm. it is beautiful and wow. that I, I it's I, I would say it's really hard to be unhappy at the beach so yeah. the other part that I, I wanted to talk about was it, it's really interesting because I think everybody should have a coach everybody should mm. um, really look to partner grab a partner on any endeavor that you do so i coach with uh, a woman her name's jennifer welsh and we coach every week and let me tell you i got the intellectual stuff down but as soon as we start talking about the emotional stuff i can't even form words like it's just <laughs> way above my head. Like uh, it, it's like speaking Mandarin. You, you're you're <laughs> talking in Mandarin. I don't know what you're saying, but it's really gigantically helpful in identifying what these emotions are and how they've impacted me over the course of my life. How they've worked to help me and how they've challenged me to to grow. And this <laughs> is exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's hard to get around it, that's for sure. It mm-hmm. really is. It is it is truly <laughs> just like you said, it's the last frontier. Because we can have mm-hmm. we can have everything nailed. We could have our nutrition, we could we yeah. could improve and, and shut off some of the genes that will affect us. We can exercise. But if our mm-hmm. mental emotional stat uh, or status is not Mm -hmm. coming from, let's say, gratitude or abundance, Mm -hmm. there's going to be trouble Mm -hmm. because that, too, can actually affect the epigenetics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that's what's so funny is writing this book, and I just will will back me on this. It's so hard to write a book in a linear fashion when it's a completely nonlinear process. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it's like you tug on any component or you cut on any component of that tree and you're going to harm the whole tree. But it also, mm-hmm. if you come back and heal that little wound of that portion of that tree we discussed, you're also going to impact positively the rest of the tree. So that's where we try and explain to folks, you know, you don't really have to tackle all 10 at once. You could tackle one mm-hmm. and start to yeah. make a massive improvement, a massive change. Mm-hmm. We, we try to offer that you know, kind of cut through the overwhelm, cut through the myths that are out there and start to bring some empowerment and some hope back to the picture. I love that. And by the way, that tree analogy is brilliant. I love that. I absolutely, absolutely love that. Ladies, I really want to thank you so much for taking your time to be on our podcast today. Do you have any parting words? Where can people find you in the world? Um, 
Nisha, you want to start first? Sure. So, again, um, if you want to find out more what I'm up to and the other types of lectures and sharing that I do, please check me out at OptimalTerrainConsulting.com. And that also, under that same Facebook name, you can follow activities of what's happening with Optimal Terrain there on Facebook. And then just I also have a, a Facebook page for our book, The Metabolic Approach to Cancer. And we try and keep you up to speed about things like this, our, our interview with you, and also new and updated research and information and recipes and whatnot that really tie into the book and the ideology around the book. Um, and then you can also follow me on places like LinkedIn and, and whatnot. But I do consult with people from, to help them take that 37,000, um, you know, foot view of what's going on and condense it into a very focused, individualized, precise roadmap to help them know exactly what's going on with their terrain and exactly how to bring it back to balance. I love it. And that is OptimalTerrainConsulting.com, correct? You got it. And Metabolic Approach to Cancer. You got it. Perfect. Um, Jess, tell us, tell people yeah, where I, they can find you. Yeah, so I can be found at remissionnutrition.com, and so we have a website there. I, we do individual uh, consulting, but we also do group uh, classes, including, you know, a, a big telesession about what to eat during chemo, what to eat during surgery, what to eat during radiation. We have a big education program starting this fall and so um and then we also do some practitioner training on how to um, implement the ketogenic diet um with clients so yeah that that all that information can be found on remissionnutrition.com and um and then we do the facebook uh bit as well and so mm -hmm. that's the, the best spot yeah brilliant thank you so much um, that is remissionnutrition.com. Folks, that will all be in the show notes, so you don't have to, if you're driving, you don't have to stop the car and, and write. Um, the, the, yeah. the founder of chiropractic, Dee Dee Palmer, said mm -hmm. that you never underestimate what you think, say, and do today will impact the lives of millions tomorrow. And you mm -hmm. ladies have done that. What your work, yeah. what you've done today will impact people years from now it will it is your legacy it will far outlive all of us and i am grateful for our time together wow wow what a blessing thank you thank you so much that means a uh, lot thank you for sharing with our audience today folks if you like what you heard please go to itunes and leave a review it helps us help you and I really appreciate it. This is one you're going to want to listen to again and again. You can find the book, The Metabolic Approach to Cancer, Integrating Deep Nutrition, the Ketogenic Diet, and Non-Toxic Bio-Individualized Therapies on Amazon or any of your booksellers. And I will also, that link will be in the, the show notes as well. So I want to appreciate and honor you all for taking the time to listen. Have a great day, everyone. Ciao.